Okay. Um, welcome everybody to today's uh, colloquium. Um, today's guest uh, speaker is Theo Tenusen. Uh, he has uh, um, gotten a MA in philosophy from Radboud University and uh, is currently also affiliated with uh, 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 Radboud as well. Uh, he's a lecturer and a researcher at the Han University of Applied Sciences uh, Department of IT. And uh, he has a lot of industry experience. His previous roles and positions include uh, senior consultant of business and strategy at IBM Global Services uh, and project manager at Nielsen, uh, as well as senior consultant of advanced technologies at Oracle, so all large companies. And today's talk will be on new theories for documentation in continuous software development. Theo, we're very happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Just checking, you can see my presentation? Yes, we can see your presentation. Yeah. Um, okay, new theories for documentation in continuous software development. This presentation is to uh, shape my thoughts for a new paper. So uh, you're my guinea pigs. That, uh, to see if it makes sense what I'm telling and a little bit of history and context. Um, at the end of this uh, presentation, you will know what uh, continuous software development is. It's a wide range of tools that are used for all steps in the life cycle of a software product. Uh, new approaches or theories for uh, design when done executable documentation and modern technologies to retrieve uh, decisions, process documentation and organizational information. And uh, I'd like to share with you how I uh, conducted data collection in participatory action research. Well, this was already introduced, so I skipped this one, except for at the lower left, you can find the presentation, theotonusen.nl slash ICS, and um, there it is. Um, so, the background. Um, what I know from the industry, but also from students, our students, that uh, maybe you know the abbreviation too long, didn't read. No student or no professional likes to write, and no lecturer or teacher or manager likes to read. So, uh, um, but nothing isn't possible. So you have to write something, you have to document something. So that's the background of this uh, research. And the question is then what is just enough to start an iteration, complete an iteration and transfer knowledge to new team members? Well, continuous software development, uh, that's what we are focusing on now. And uh, what is continuous software development? How do we characterize this? Well, it covers the values, principles, practices, tools, and processes from lean, agile, and DevOps. And in lean, anything is considered as waste what does not contribute to the end product. Uh, in Agile, uh, one of the Agile uh, values is that uh, working software is uh, valued over comprehensive documentation. And in DevOps, one of the leading principles is fast time to market. And um, so that's the first characteristic of continuous software development. Uh, second is that uh, CSD embraces all activities from the whole life cycle of a software product, including design, maintenance, and continuous architecting. Typically, um, you have um, uh, Scrum or Lean that focus on the project. You have DevOps that focus on projects, including operations and maintenance, but continuously architecting, that's not part of it. So we include that as well and also the retirement of the software product. So what we have in mind is the software as a product and then the life cycle of that software product. Um, CSD considers the continuously changing state of the software product, including stakeholder concerns, contextual factors, progressive insights, bugs, new features, or other unfor unforeseen factors. Um, and last, uh, what can be observed in uh, modern software development is that there 
is a whole range of tools and even a whole range of categories of tools that is used in software development. And, um, uh, and every tool has a little bit of information on the software product and there is not a central repository where all, for, all information about the software product is um, uh, collected. So you have in the, the, the commit messages in Git, you have your, uh, your um, uh, annotations in the software, you have uh, uh, infrastructure as code in the CICD pipeline, you have PowerPoints for uh, conveying ideas about the software product. And all those tools share a little bit of information about the software product. This is the whole slide. Um, and why a wide range of tools. I was already mentioning it that. Um, uh, well, uh, this is what you now see is just the tools, for instance, um, uh, concepts or technologies or software systems. And software systems are the tools I mentioned, but technologies can be uh, thought radar, Gardner's hype cycle, where do you get your information from? And concepts are processes, knowledge, artifacts, society, and templates, frameworks, and libraries, for, in this, for instance, Django, Angular, or uh, jQuery, that are specific tools, but that are not tools in context, that just tools that are used and uh, tools organized in stacks that makes more sense so maybe you have seen uh, full stack development is that here yeah, full stack development you see in uh, one of the uh, trees has development stack backend frontend and full stack that includes frontend and backend you also have solution stacks lamp and mean for instance or company stacks uh, facebook has a wide range of tools or google has a wide range of tools and um, these tool stacks can also be, uh, be organized in software development ecosystems. And the difference between a tool stack and an ecosystem is that the environment where you don't have control over it is part of the ecosystem. For instance, uh, the product community for Jira or for Git or uh, knowledge communities, stack overflow conferences like this one. Uh, learning community, Pluralsight, EDX, uh, uh, other communities, I don't go into that now, or society, people, planet, profit. That, uh, so you take into account the context as well. So the whole, this is not an image of the actual tools that are used, but this is an uh, organization of how tools can be organized into tools, tool stacks, and software development ecosystems. And for CSD, we consider the software development ecosystems build up of tool stacks and consist of tools. Um, three new approaches or theories, we come to that, maybe that's a discussion. Uh, design when done, executable documentation and modern technologies. Um, so documentation is a burden, both to write and to read. So the question is, what is just enough and why? And so far, what, what I've seen is that uh, you write down what helps you in shaping your thoughts or uh, shaping thoughts of the team you're working with. That what is clear to everyone doesn't have to be drawn on a whiteboard sketch, for instance. There is an example of such kind of uh, uh, shaping thoughts. This is not how a system is implemented, but that there is a mutual understanding what is relevant in a system. And second, what is required before you start an iteration is that uh, uh, you need formal codified API documentation, especially when uh, you have geographically distributed teams or when team members uh, switch from your team or uh, onboarding on your team. So they need to know that knowledge as well. And there is no big upfront, heavy loaded UML documentation. Um, uh, this is an important point to, uh, uh, to to have that in mind. So shaping thoughts up front and formal documentation as it comes to uh, uh, API documentation that you communicate with another system. 
and that must be very specific, of course. And afterwards, that's uh, what I like to research, but this is one of the uh, research questions, is design when done. So not design upfront, but design afterwards, because if you make your design upfront, uh, then probably it's a waste of time because you have progressive insights, you have uh, uh, context that changes, uh, bugs you see, that um, uh, other information that makes sense to take that into account. And uh, if you make your design afterwards, then you don't waste time. And the design is a proper description of the system so that it can be used for knowledge transfer to other team members or for ops or uh, other stakeholders. And what you have to document is um, uh, the decisions, the processes and organization with the software product. And at the lower right, you see some IEEE standards that are used. That's fine to use, but afterwards and not upfront. So if you use it upfront, then you probably will shape your thoughts and you will do something different. That's OK. Um, and it has a few advantages. Uh, we think as um, as a teacher, I see that it helps students. Uh, uh, it's common practice. You also see that in um, in the industry. So uh, let's start with a whiteboard sketch and from whiteboard to keyboard and let's uh, develop, especially when small teams in one room that makes sense. Um, so it, it fits with the common practice and uh, but not for all organizations. So uh, well, legislation is important such as governments or pharmacy or military then um, that needs to be uh, documented as well so uh, it doesn't fit for all industries and um, in literature research i did not find any method yet that describes this uh, practice Um, what I found in previous research is executable documentation and executable documentation. Well, you know, if you write documentation, for instance, a Word document, that's always right. It never tells you, well, maybe your syntax isn't right or maybe your grammar isn't right. But, um, uh, uh, but for the rest, it, there's no relation between uh, the system you describe and how it is described. And what we think is executable documentation. Um, you can execute it, so you can test your documentation. It's uh, highly readable, even for uh, non-developers. And um, uh, it, is, it, it, it shares the characteristics how developers work. So it's different, it's a different task to develop code and to write documentation. But if it's with executable documentation, it shares a lot about the characteristics and then it might make sense for developers to write better documentation. Um, of course, it's never out of sync because it's a different presentation of the software. It's not the software, but a different presentation. It can be tested and well, not intrusive. Like I mentioned, it's the same way as, uh, as developers work as they develop code. For instance, Cucumber or um, uh, Ansible or infrastructure as code. Then uh, modern technologies. This is uh, an image from previous research. It's uh, maybe too much for uh, uh, to drop it now, but there is a relation between uh, the ease of human, uh, human communication on the lower right and uh, capturing. So what's visual? Visuals are easy to capture and easy to understand, but are hard for automatic processing. And uh, constructing software code is easy uh, for automatic processing, but not so good for human communication. Um, and uh, what we can see here is that there is a gap on the upper right where there is no type of information or amount of structure. And um, what, uh, what I want to investigate is if it's possible with modern learning techniques, uh, with a trade-off between explainability and learning performance, if it's 
possible to retrieve information of uh, um, information that's scattered, through, uh, scattered throughout all the uh, tools that are used in uh, continuous software development. And decision trees are, of course, easy for explainability and deep learning uh, is easier. Well, that has a higher perf uh, learning performance, uh, but it, that's a black box. So um, the candidate technologies here are recommender engines, explainable AI and text mining, but I have to research uh, of these are indeed the candidate technologies or I have to um, extend it or uh, move the candidate technologies from this list. Um, what I also did is uh, this uh, data collection in uh, participatory action research. I um, did a consultancy uh, assignment and I come in a minute to that uh, profile of that company and others and um, to see does it work design when done. So design when done, I collected information for that new approach. And um, uh, uh, I made a difference, uh, maybe it's all well known to everyone, between a theoretical sciences and empirical sciences. For instance, theoretical is math and philosophy. And that starts with a terms and proposition and ends with a theory. It is a collection of arguments. And on the right side, you start with a problem and you end with a solution. And one of the uh, parts that are shared are the inference engines. The logical reasons are deduction, abduction, and induction, and uh, statistical inferences. So uh, both in theoretical sciences and empirical sciences use the same logic and statistics. Um, uh, and um, this is important because I want to understand if it's a theory or is it just an approach and not uh, to bother about semantics, but to be sure that what, what am I developing here and what is the use of it for others, both in, uh, on, uh, for students and in the industry. This is how I collected data with participatory action research. So um, uh, it starts with the most objective to the most subjective. On the top is a literature review that is more objective than a contract. And I had a contract and, um, uh, and I had influences in there with that company. Uh, the company profile and assignments um, well, what's interesting is the CEO. Um, if you know uh, uh, someone who doesn't want to write and doesn't want to read, then someone who is dyslectic has even a higher uh, hurdle to overcome that. So he doesn't like to write and he doesn't like to read. And uh, well, he has a company with uh, 95 million euro uh, per year, 250 employees, 30 40 systems, um, uh, uh, 40 IT contracts, uh, not all are signed, and whatever works is okay. And the assignment was uh, create a vision on existing and future IT and engage stakeholders, um, take a look at IT security from a technical, social, and legal point of view, um, build an IT organization and uh, coaching for the implementation. So, uh, well, part of it is uh, observation and part of it is experimentation. So I listened, of course, and I influenced and the influences are on the right side. It doesn't matter much what I uh, suggested there, but this is how I collected the information and um, uh, I think I'm already at the end. Uh, now you will know uh, in continuous software development, there's a wide range of tools that are used for all steps in the life cycle of a software product. New approaches that I'm investigating are design when done. That's the low hanging fruit. 
Executable documentation looks a lot like uh, uh, test-driven development and modern uh, technologies such as uh, explainable AI and how I collected the data for design when done. And this is the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, let's have a round of applause for first uh, for our speaker before we go on to the questions. Okay, so uh, we have a few minutes for the for the questions. Um, so if you want to ask one, please raise your hand. And while you do that, let me ask a small question myself first. Um, you have shown us that the you know that the, uh, you have given us a, basically a picture of the software development ecosystem, yeah. which is getting ever so complicated, right? I mean, yeah. when I was a student of computer engineering in the early 90s, we were taught programming in different languages, but these ecosystems, tool stacks, the metacognitive tools, they were largely missing. And when they, you know, when they taught us about documentation, that was limited to three things. You, you had um, a requirements elicitation, a design yep. document, and a user manual. That was it, basically. Yep. Yep. So my question is, did the education of software design keep up with this changing ecosystem? You know, is it agile enough to be updated fast enough? Um, I mean, are these modern techniques that you describe you know do, do, are they being discussed in the education now uh, no not at all so it's yeah. the same practice as you describe in the 90s and uh, in the 90s it didn't make sense and now it doesn't make sense <laughs> so um okay um uh, but it's a practice to know but yeah <laughs> yeah there is a practice how teacher uh, how students work and how uh, practitioners in the industry work so uh, and i think it makes more sense what i described that up front you need sh to shape your thoughts and be exact in uh, the api documentation and afterwards you need to transfer knowledge about the system for maintenance or uh, for other team members so uh, that's that's the practice so uh, but there's no method to describe that it, um, okay but but you know ours the old style was basically a one size fits all solution but now the software has so many different types of users yep, right that's right i mean yep. we don't want probably the same solution for everyone or for yep. every type of software yep. so where does that come into play i mean who would use the machine learning approach for example if i'm just looking for some library in github to plug into my software I probably wouldn't need the machine learning approach, would I? Or would, do I need it? Uh, now, the, the type of information you need, and um, if you look at uh, git commit messages, then usually is typed in, in a single line, uh, what has been changed and not why it has been changed. Okay. And um, uh, that's a common practice. And I talk to people from the industry, and that's, uh, even if you look at, um, uh, large open software projects uh, for Linux or um, uh, TensorFlow or uh, Bash or uh, LaTeX or whatever. That uh, its comments are almost always uh, what has been changed and not why it has been changed. And what you need as a software developer or a stakeholder to understand why. Uh, you, you want to know why has been this decision been taken? Why is that? So that's the information that needs to be retrieved, not how it's done, because that's there. You can read the code, and uh, but you do you do not know why that decision has been taken or what, what the options were. So that information is somewhere in some tool, and um, uh, you need to retrieve that information. And for that, the, these approaches could be useful. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Shaq has a question. Shaq, go ahead, please. Hello, uh, Theo. Thanks for your uh, presentation. Uh, <clears throat> and my, my question is about why not use uh, speech technology for getting the uh, ah. design rationale or the specification yeah, rationale? Yeah, yeah that's, uh, uh, that's, that's indeed an option. And um, um, one of the pictures is that um, uh, visual or audio that is easy to understand, but hard for automatic uh, for automatic uh, processing. So that's one. Um, those modern technologies.
come in to understand how that's been done. So there is um, there is nothing for the ease of understanding that can be automatic processed. Well, uh, I, I think the, this week it was announced that uh, on this uh, Teams uh, that we are using here from Microsoft, yeah. we can put on uh, automatic capture. Great. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's yeah. So, but, but, uh, yeah. but then, uh, 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 of course, you can't um, uh, search in audio, so it needs to be text. And I think that was one of the advantages how uh, Microsoft advocated it. If you're uh, joining uh, a, a team meeting later, then you can read what has been told before. Um, so what I think what you do, what, what, what needs to be done is uh, to transform it into text because that's easier to process. That, um, yeah, and, and or summarized, but uh, there are uh, people working on that, so. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, um, uh, but that's still a gap. Uh, well, it, it, uh, it's a kind of gap. So there's, there's been some fight. progress there, but it's certainly not um, completed and finished and uh, etc. If you look, for instance, in um, in the chats for uh, Discord or uh, other chat tools, then there's a right. Well, uh, there's a lot dropped in there. And sometimes it makes sense, and sometimes it's just angriness. And um, well, maybe angriness is important. I don't know. But um, it, design decisions are in chats. Angriness is the uh, domain of uh, our professor in social and effective computing. Uh, so <laughs> I think that. Uh... Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shaq. Uh, so Gerard has a question. Yes, Theo. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, first question would be: uh, You might you make a kind of plea for executable uh, documentation. Uh, yeah. Well, I have some experience with this, I must say, and in general. But could you please comment on this? Yeah. Um, the quality, readability of executable documentation is, I would say, low in many cases. It gives a lot of information but is not very accessible to human readers, I would say. Um, does this conflict with your idea of having this executable documentation? Uh, two remarks. One is, uh, uh, it is it's kind of readable. Um, so, so it's kind of readable, so that, um, that's uh, what I do not agree with you, but um, it's not used very much, so why not? That um, so maybe it looks at uh, I think how it's characterized. I think that makes sense, and it is readable. Uh, uh, for instance, Cucumber is kind of readable. You can discuss about that, but I think it's kind of readable. It's better readable right. than source code and uh, or all the technical documentation. And um, uh, but the question is why um, why isn't anyone used that? that so that um, <laughs> well, perhaps I because it's that. not readable. Yeah. Sorry. Perhaps nobody uses it because it's not that readable. Um, I have to look into that. I don't know. That's okay. A, yeah. No, it was just that's a thing. question. That uh, yeah. I have another question for you, which is uh, uh, design when done. Yeah. Uh, well, especially in the uh, in the agile field, there's a. Well, continuing discussion because I don't think the discussion has ended and it started some 20 years ago. And that has to do with architecture. Yeah. Uh, um, think of uh, so called sp sprint zeros doing some yep. upfront design yep. still. Um, would you think um, design when done in combination with your executable information? would be able to produce, let's say, a kind of architectural drawing of the system? Um, uh, uh, I think kind of. Um, what I didn't mention is anything that can be reverse engineered or generated, there's no need to document it because you can find it. But, um, so sure. if uh, if you uh, take into account that four plus one diagram from uh, Kruchten, then um, 
with the process diagram and uh, yeah. the main diagram, etc. If you can reverse engineer your infrastructure, for instance, that's infrastructure is not architecture, but then you have a kind of view how uh, your infrastructure looks like. And um, uh, uh, well, architecture is is a continuous process. That um, and if uh, applications are redesigned every five or ten years or whatever, then the information that remains to exist are usually the data, not the database, but the data, the UI, and the business functionality. And the technology is changed. Uh, and uh, or the architecture is changed. And uh, so you need to document the um, architecture afterwards because that makes much more. Of course, you need to draw up something up front, well, but not everything, not completely. And you have to take into account that you have progressive insights, et cetera. But, um, OK, then would you say that when doing this, let, let, let's take an example. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to uh, reverse engineer whether uh, our system application has, uh, for instance, a uh, microservices architecture or uh, entire architecture? Would you be able to reverse engineer such statements? Um, well, I have to look into that because um, if you define uh, microservices architecture as a system of systems where you are in control well, then it's just a big system. Yeah. But if, uh, if it's an architecture with microservices that you are not in control over, then uh, what you define at the end is an API and not a system. So the context of the system is anything that communicates it with and you don't have control over. And when it's a system of systems, well, then you are more in control and then it's probably easier to reverse engineer than just um, uh, uh, microservices. Thank does it you. answer your question? Yes, it does. We could discuss on that. Yeah, of course. That there are other people uh, yeah. in the meeting, so thank you. Thank you, Gerard. So this was a really interesting point that the systems um, that were um, re reverse engineering the code to generate the documentation or some abstraction of yeah. the of the code. For example, I remember Rational Rose was able to create this um, graphical representation of the code. And then you were able to manipulate that representation and this yeah. was reflected in yeah. the code. So yeah. this was yeah. kind of like two ways compatible. Yeah. 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 But the problem is every user now, now we have much more, much wider range of users interested in the code yeah. from different aspects. Yeah. And every documentation is in, the, in, in a sense an abstraction, right? Yeah. So that means Perhaps in the future we will be able to create the documentation on the fly based on what the user is actually looking for. Yeah, right? I give what I need to. Yeah, send exactly. That, that's the the difference I make between the different stakeholders. For mm -hmm. instance, the developer or a manager or a customer or um, uh, someone else. That um, and they all have different needs for information and they have different influences on the software product. But so there's not. One document fits all, uh, yeah. depending on uh, your interests. You need that information and not other information. That's why a PowerPoint is very good for your manager, uh, but not for software developers, for instance. Just, um, yeah, yeah. Um, there was one comment from Thomas about um, the link to the slides to be posted in the chat. Um, Thomas, if you are, have um, access to a microphone, and you do you have a question specifically related to a slide or is it was it just for archival purposes or is Thomas still here? I think he's here, but yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Um so after the talk the, the link will be posted so you can you can rewatch the video and you can you can check. Um are there any last questions for our speaker? OK, um, in this case, let's have a final round of applause. Thank you very much for this interesting talk, Theo.
And thank you all for joining us today and see you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, all.